Miracy. Hey, it's Melinda, your host, and today I'm thrilled to introduce a new addition to the Miracy FM Podcast Network, Teacher Tom's Podcast, Taking Play Seriously, hosted by the insightful teacher Tom Hobson. This podcast is all about effective educators being somewhat subversive, doing their best teaching in the cracks. To give you a taste, I'm sharing an episode right here in your feed. In this episode, teacher Tom talks to the incredible Lenore Skenazy, founder of Let Grow, advocating for free-range parenting and childhood independence. And in a world of bubble-wrapped children and helicopter parenting, Lenore is the voice of reason that we need. Why should coaches be excited about Teacher Tom's podcast? It's shaping a better learning environment for children, educators, and parents. And as coaches, we know the power of play and creativity and how it directly influences our strategies and individual development. And Lenore, also called America's worst mom by one reporter at the New York Times, is inspiring and courageous. I think you're going to enjoy this. When you start framing everything that a kid does, from the walk to school, to their grade on a test, to anything that they want to do on their own, going to the park, eating a Pop-Tart, <laughs> if it's all framed as you know something that could end up harming them the worst way possible and it's all your fault, life becomes so scary for you and really scary for the kid. Hi, I'm Teacher Tom, and this is my podcast. As a boy, even as young as four years old, mom would say, Tom, you're driving me crazy. Go outside. And then she'd send me out there and close the door behind me. And she didn't expect to see me again until she rang the dinner bell. And she had a literal dinner bell, as did all the other moms in our neighborhood. Most of my childhood memories involve being outdoors with other children unsupervised. Today, there is an expectation that virtually every minute of a child's life must be supervised by a responsible adult. The result is that today's preschoolers will spend their entire childhoods under adult supervision. Today, my mom and all the other moms on the block would probably receive a visit from Child Protective Services, you know, or worse. I'm talking to my friend and, at least according to one reporter at the New York Times, America's worst mom. You may know Lenore Skenazy as the founder of the Free Range Parenting Movement and all-round advocate for childhood independence. Among her work is the Free Range Parenting blog and book. She's the creator of Take Our Children to the Park and Leave Them Their Day. And she was the host of the reality TV show, America's Worst Mom. She is also the founder and face of Let Grow, a nonprofit that promotes free range parenting and childhood independence. In a world of bubble wrap children, helicopter parenting, and the fear of a kidnapper lurking behind every tree, Lenore is the voice of reason we need. Hi, Lenore. Welcome to the podcast. Well, hello there, Teacher Tom. So for the people who don't know you, I just want to say something about you that you're probably tired of talking about. But in 2008, you wrote an article called Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. And it created a firestorm, right? And probably in your life more than anybody else's. And from that, you wrote a book and you started a movement. Could you just tell us just a little bit about that? Sure. After the article appeared, I live here in New York City where all the media are and the media pounced. <laughs> so two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, yada, 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 defending my decision to let my son do something by himself, especially in New York and the subways and the bowels of hell. And what really got my goat was that I was constantly asked this question, you know, okay, you let your son go. He had a great time. You had a great time, et cetera, et cetera. But how would you have felt if he hadn't come home? And that was always the gotcha question mm -hmm. as if they didn't know, <laughs> right? Hmm, how would I feel a little uh, bummed, you know, depressed, I guess, for a little while, maybe I need some therapy. So they knew exactly how I would feel. And the fact that they were asking the question meant that they'd come up with this ingenious way to take a tale of triumph, a kid doing something on his own in the big city, a mom who trusted him, you know, a happy day for everyone, and turn it into a near tragedy or a hypothetical could have been a tragedy. And then they were back on the terra firma for the media, which is a cautionary tale of a mother who let her child do something without 
her there and he died or he could have died and could have like, it doesn't even matter, right? It just goes straight to that dark place. So I started the blog called Free Range Kids after that sort of trial by fire to say, I actually love safety. I love helmets and seat belts and mouth guards. And I love my child. <laughs> I expected him to come home. I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think he was really capable and that the odds were overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly in our favor. And after I started the Free Range Kids blog, then as you noted, I wrote a book called Free Range Kids. And I really wanted to figure out how did we get to the point where that question looms over every decision we're making for our children. How would we feel if they don't make it? And when you start framing everything that a kid does, from the walk to school, to their grade on a test, to anything that they want to do on their own, going to the park, eating a Pop-Tart, <laughs> if it's all framed as you know something that could end up harming them the worst way possible, and it's all your fault, life becomes so scary for you and really scary for the kid. And you're sort of frozen with fear because you've rewritten childhood, which is a sort of independence growing, you know, joyful and frustrating time into a time of just danger and regret. And I feel bad for parents who have to think that way when they're raising their kids. And I feel bad for kids because the upshot is that we barely let them do anything on their own because how would we feel if dot, dot, dot. Right. You know, and I've told you this before, but I just want everybody to hear this, is that you started blogging, I think we started in, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And of course, you had all this publicity around you, and you really influenced me a great deal as an educator. You helped me really set aside my fears of things that might happen with young children. It's because of you that I had the courage to bring out hammers and nails for young children, that I let even two-year-olds use hot glue guns. And the term that I came up with a lot was catastrophic imaginations. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we all have the catastrophic imaginations. I could say to people, I can always imagine there's a jet engine about to fall on your head, no matter what you're doing. And so you better watch out. So I really, you know, I want to just express my gratitude to you for that, because you really freed me in many ways to become Teacher Tom. But, you know, now you've gone beyond that, right? Because that was a while ago. That son is now an adult. Now you're really taking direct action in trying to help parents and educators and, frankly, the whole world, because we have an international audience. And you've started an organization with the help of a couple other people called Let Grow. So could maybe tell us a little bit about this. You say on your website, it's a movement for childhood independence. That's exactly what it is. Thanks for teeing this up for me, Tom. So it was about five years ago that Jonathan Haidt, which everyone thinks is Jonathan Haidt. He's the social psychologist. He wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. He wrote The Righteous Mind. Wrote a lot about the mind. Was talking to a guy named Daniel Shuckman who was chairman for a long time of FIRE, which fights for free speech on campus. From the left, from the right, all he wants is free speech because he believes that kids can handle it and free speech is the basis of democracy. But the two of them were worried that kids on campus were, whenever they felt uncomfortable, they actually thought they were unsafe. That's why they needed trigger warnings. That's why they needed safe spaces. And it felt like rather than embracing the wide world of ideas and possibilities and people across a spectrum, kids were feeling fragile. And they thought, you know, we can try to inculcate bravery and open-mindedness in college students, but why not start when they're younger? Is there anyone who is looking at the problem of kids growing up sort of fearful and unresilient at a young age and fighting it there. And John said, well, I love free range kids. I read the book. We're raising free range kids. Let's talk to Lenore. So they came to me and they said, let's start a nonprofit. And I said, okay, uh, uh, with three caveats. One is I don't run it. <laughs> you know, I'm happy to be the president and, and speak on, a, on every podcast, but I don't know how to run an organization. Two is we have to fold in Peter Gray who is the psychology professor at Boston College, who has spent his life studying the importance of mixed age kids just playing together and making their own fun and all the developmental richness that goes into that. So we have to bring in Peter Gray. And then also, look, I've been talking about free range kids for 10 years now. I've traveled the globe and everybody nods along. Everybody agrees. They remember their childhood. They loved it. They had fun. They climbed trees. They got into scrapes. They literally got scrapes. So they all agree that something has changed and it's terrible and let's fight it, but they couldn't do it. 
nothing was changing. They would go home from my talks, they would read my book, they'd give me high fives, but nothing was actually changing in the culture. And I said, so if we're going to start a nonprofit and it's going to, you know, take years and dollars, let's make sure that we are devoted to changing behavior, not just changing minds. The actual phrase in psychology is that behavior change is the most effective cognitive change, which is what we were saying. So we decided to start Let Grow with the goal of making it easy and normal and legal to give kids back their independence. But the easy and normal part is like, how do you get parents to see how wonderful it is? Like the amazing things that kids are capable of doing, the two-year-olds with the glue guns, the seven-year-olds crossing the street, the 11-year-olds babysitting again instead of being babysitted. How do you get parents to see that when they can't let go? So you sort of have to figure out how to put the cart before the horse, because once they do let their kids go, then they can recognize like, oh my God, look, I didn't realize my kid was capable of that. This is wonderful. But they don't see it until they let go, but they're not willing to let go because they haven't seen it yet. So Let Grow's whole mission is to come up with ways to make giving kids independence, like plain old normal independence, like we all had when we were growing up, easy and normal and something that they just do without having to dither. How would you feel if they never came home? Yeah, that's it. I talk to adults about this kind of all the time and I ask them to like reflect on their own childhoods and think of a beautiful moment. And invariably they're talking about being outside unsupervised. And typically they're talking about doing things that their parents or other adults would disapprove of. And then they always say, we were so stupid. Were they stupid? What do we get when we do those stupid things? Well, stupid or adventurous, I guess you decide. You know, the other thing is like, there's that phrase, like, how do you get wisdom? Wisdom comes from experience. How do you get experience by making, you know, bad choices, basically? (laughs) That's a mangling of an otherwise really perfect Cohen that I can't remember. But the point is that how do you stop being stupid? You realize, oh my God, (laughs) that was too far. That was too high. That was too many matches at once. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Why are we using gunpowder? Um, this is dumb. Wow, I can't swim. So you don't want to be that stupid. But boy, were we stupid is said with generally a little pat on the back yep. mm-hmm. of oneself. It's not done like, well, I was a real idiot. I was a moron. It's not that. It's like instead of the humble brag of, boy, were we brave or boy, were we resourceful, or boy, were we resilient and clever and creative back then. That's what they mean by stupid. Yeah. And we're so worried that kids will actually be stupid that we don't let them be it. We don't let them have these experiences that maybe involve a little risk or frustration or fear. It's as if we think they can't handle anything. So the real problem is that our culture has insisted that adults always be supervising kids now. I I was just writing about this the other day. There was a guy I met in D.C., and we're talking about this, and he said, come to think about it. You know, he walked to school, blah, 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 and now he walks his seven-year-old to the bus stop, and then he waits there with her. It's about five houses from where he lives. He waits there with her until the bus comes, and, you know, other parents are waiting with their kids. And I said, why do you do that? And he said, long pause, I have no idea. Many schools will not allow the bus driver to drop the kid off after school until they're 8, 9, 10, 27, unless there is an adult waiting there at the bus stop to walk them home. I've heard from parents whose kids are dropped off at the end of their driveway (laughs) who must wave from the window. Yes, I'm home. I'm here. I don't have an Uzi. Let the kid off the bus. And so I don't even blame parents for the so-called helicopter generation because what's happened is the norms have changed to the point where the kids are not developing any of the frustration tolerance that they would if they knew they had to power through a difficult day or an argument with a friend or kids who don't want to play their game. That was literally the case in this parent who got summoned to a a camp. Her kid had suggested a game. The kids wanted to play something else. The kid was so mad, he said, come pick me up. And by the time the mom got there, of course, the kid was playing. But in the meantime, she interrupted him And she said after that, she and the camp director, and I think, and the kid decided no more phones, no more phones at camp, because the whole idea is that if you always have this crutch known as mom or dad or coach or teacher or somebody adult who is ready to swoop in and fix everything, 
you never learn how to fix anything. And that's a bad way to go through life. That's the definition of anxiety, thinking I can't handle this. Somebody else better handle it. If they don't, I'll be in real danger. And so please come save me. I mean, what's more anxious than that? So you have a culture that has normalized adults always catering to kids and always with kids. And no wonder kids are growing up anxious and depressed and passive. Nobody talks about the passivity. But of course you'd be passive if all you have to do is press a button and mom comes and takes you away to ice cream. But so I, it feels like this has all happened in a very short amount of time. Is that true? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm rapidly aging out, but I've heard from, you know, parents who are in their 40s or even mid 30s who do recall a very different childhood where you could walk to school. I mean, I have all sorts of statistics, Mm -hmm. but it used to be that the majority of kids walk to school and now it's about one in 10. And boy, the University of Michigan just did this fascinating study that I, you should talk to the lady who ran it. I will. Sarah Clark. Yeah, you'll like her. She and her team at the University of Michigan at their children's hospital asked parents about independence. And so across the board, these thousand parents who represented every demographic group felt that independence was very important for their children's development. But as the survey showed, but then there was a quote unquote sizable gap (laughs) between (laughs) what they were thinking and what they were doing. And the majority of parents of kids age five to eight would not let their children make their own snack. Wow. A snack. Okay. And then the majority of parents of kids age nine to 11 would not let them play together at the park, would not let their kid walk to a friend's house to say, you know, is Betsy home? And my favorite statistic, even though it was just 50%, 50% of parents of kids age nine to 11, which by the way, is like Tom Sawyer age, Uh would not let their kids go to another aisle in the store. Oh my God. I saw that on your Twitter feed and I just was amazed at just how that's suffocating or consequences for the children themselves. Do you see any consequences for kind of the wider society? Because you do say on your website that you're, you know, creating new path for parent schools and America. What are the consequences for us as a society to have this sort of, I don't know, fear-based parenting happening? Well, first of all, let's just talk about moms for a second. As soon as the industrial revolution came along and some of the old drudgery was being replaced with new appliances, that a book was published, actually several books, about how to be the perfect housewife. And they said things like, setting the perfect table is not as easy as it may seem. And so the demands, <laughs> the demands of being uh, you know, the woman of the house inched up even as things should have been getting easier and more opportunities for independence and you know, self-actualization. And it sort of seems to me <laughs> that helicopter parenting and the demands that you make the organic baby food and watch every soccer practice and read with your child every night and sign the, the homework log, all that seemed to have exploded even as women were entering the workforce and doing better and better in college and in life. And so that's the conspiracy theory side of me, but that's one thing that has changed. Just as you would expect women to be really much more free and flourishing, the demands became much greater. Anyways, it's hard to read anything in the media or watch and not see something about this giant tsunami of anxiety and depression in kids. Okay, that's terrible. I mean, there's sad things that go along with anxiety and depression, and I don't want to talk about them because they're pretty obvious. But as those are going up, America is not getting better as its young children and teens and young adults need therapy and time off from work and direct instruction at the workplace. So what's happening to the country? We're dealing with this crisis of young people who end up being young adults. And what we're hearing from employers is that they're nice kids. You know, there's a lot to be said for them, but they're like, okay, now tell me what to do next and I'll do it. I don't want to do it wrong. All right. So let's talk about some specifics about what Let Grow is all about, right? You have the kind of three basic platforms. You've got school programs, you have advocacy and legislation, and then you help support parents and families in the kind of this project. So what are some of the school programs or what are the school programs all about? The school programs are really about making it easy to give kids back this independence that parents don't know when to give them or how. So what is it? It's a homework assignment that teachers give kids. All our stuff is free, by the way. All our materials, our implementation guide, you name it, it's all free. So it's a homework assignment that teachers give the kids K through eight, and now we're working on a high school version. And the the homework assignment says this, but in more words, (laughs) go home and do something new with your parents' permission, but without your parents. 
And this is the key that unlocks the door because parents who didn't know if they could let their kids make their own snack or go a couple aisles away at the grocery or walk to the park are pushed to doing it because for God's sake, it's a homework assignment. You don't want your kid to fail, right? And all the other parents are doing it. So there's less guilt or weirdness and the teachers are saying to do it. So there's a little push from an authority figure. At some schools, they read the stuff off at the, you know, over the public address system in the morning, you know, today, you know, yesterday, Fred went and got his own ice cream or whatever. So by doing that, the parents finally let go and they talked with the kids about what they want to do. And maybe the kid wanted to go too far. So there's some compromise involved, but they do let their kids do something. And a lot of the kids for one of their let grow projects, they decide to make pancakes or scrambled eggs. It's generally one of those two really something easy. Sometimes they make cookies. And they all say this. And I thought the first time I heard it, I thought it was just bad writing. They say like, I thought I was going to burn down the house or I was afraid I would burn down the house. And I saw that it's with sixth graders here in Manhattan. And then I saw it with kids in California. And where was I just, just in Las Vegas in a very working class school. And they were saying the same thing. So they must have been told somewhere along the way, or they get the message, no, you can't do that. Why? It's too dangerous. Let me do that for you. And that comes through to the kid that like, it really is dangerous because I'm not allowed to do it. Something terrible might happen. I guess I could burn down the house. Instead of thinking this is going to be fun or this is going to be hard, but I can do it. It's this is going to be catastrophic. This is going to be the end. And it is such a breakthrough when the kids make the scrambled eggs. When they do this, they get this new sense of themselves and the world. It's really a fundamental thing. And the parents who went from thinking my kid is lovely, but you know, the minute they try to do anything, they're going to fail and I, it's going to be a disaster, rewire themselves. I mean, it's impossible not to be rewired because now you're seeing the kid eating scrambled eggs that they made on a flame. And so it's such a liberating thing for both generations that we get both generations excited because part of the let grow experience kit if you want to call it that that you download has a a little piece of paper shaped like a leaf you cut it out and it says you know what i did for my let grow project and how'd it go and we've gone to schools and seen the hallways festooned with let grow trees with let grow leaves growing on them and you just see these fantastic things i rode my bike it was fun i made eggs it was delicious i cooked for my dog it was fun one girl wrote this extraordinarily horribly spelled, I went to the S-T-O-R, it went W-H-E-E-L, which was it went wheel, I had to pay with my M-O-N-Y, and it was hard, H-R-D, but I loved my Let Grow project. Oh my God, it's, it's just transformative. You're talking about, I mean, that's a true transformation. They truly are different people. Everybody's a different person after those kinds of experiences. And I was going to say exactly what you said, I was going to say, I love the festooned hallways, but at the same time, it makes me a little sad that we have to do it. But I'm glad that you're working on that. Now, let's talk a little bit about advocacy and legislation. Sure. So, you know, we want kids to be out and about. And sometimes parents will write to us and say, I'm not worried about kidnappers if I send my kid outside. I'm worried about somebody calling 911. And I'm partly the reason they're worried about somebody calling 911, because whenever this happens, the person finds me somehow by hook or by crook, and I end up writing an article about it and fulminating, and it goes viral, and, start, and people start thinking like, this is happening every day. It's not happening every day, but the fact that it happens at all gets my goat so much that I was talking about it in a lecture once, and thank goodness, one guy who heard me, a guy named Connor Boyack out of Utah, thought parents shouldn't have to worry about this being legal to let their kids, you know, play or walk outside or whatever. So he went back to Utah and he found a guy named Lincoln Fillmore who sponsored what they called a free range parenting law. And it says that letting kids do the age old activities of childhood is not neglect, right? Neglect is when you put your kid in serious and obvious danger, not anytime you take your eyes off them. So that passed unanimously in Utah in 2018, and then it went to Texas, passed, and in Oklahoma also passed. And then it looked like, what is this, a red state thing? And so it isn't. It's something that everybody should be behind. And so this year we got wonderful proof. Well, in the meantime, Colorado passed it in 20-something or other. But this past year we got it passed in 
Virginia, Illinois, and Connecticut, which is purple, blue, and blue, unanimously. Nice. And then in Montana, not unanimously. But the point is that we've had bipartisan sponsors. You know, we've had left, right, black, white, gay, straight. I mean, any split, we've had them co-sponsoring this bill because it's so great for you no matter where you are on the political spectrum. If you're a free ranger and you want your kids to have these experiences, if you're a single mom working a double shift and you can't come home by 3.30 and you know that you're seven-year-old is ready to come inside, do her homework and, you know, watch TikTok or whatever. That's up to you. Poverty is not neglect. Coming up with something that works for you and your kids, you know your kids, you know your neighborhood, unless you're putting your kid in obvious and serious danger, the government shouldn't be second guessing you and parents shouldn't have to worry and feel like they might be second guessed. So having passed it in these eight states, we decided to sort of put all our weight behind one state this coming year. And I bet you can guess where it is. It's a big one. Is it California? It is California. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to write to you about that, <laughs> right? But what we need, here's what we need. And this is this is exactly opposite of what I was just saying. If you have been stopped <laughs> by the police or investigated by Child Protective Services for letting your kid, you know, play outside or whatever in California, write to Lenore <laughs> at letgrow.org or simply drop a note to Teacher Tom and he'll forward it to me because Those stories are what get the legislators to finally realize that this isn't just a made up problem. It's a real problem. And they don't realize like that, even if the investigation goes nowhere, you know, somebody called 911, somebody comes to your house, they talk to you, they talk to your kid, they see if they've been sexually abused, they look in your refrigerator, they close the cabinets, and then they say, no harm, no fall. It's not no harm, no fall, right? You've just had the terror of knowing that somebody with the power of the state has come to your home to decide if your parenting is good enough. I mean, that's tragic. That's horrible. It's hard enough to be a parent. So, and you talked about parents and families. So are there any specific programs you're doing with parents and families to support them? And I guess the advocacy and legislation is a key one. That's a key one, but I would say so are our school programs. And when parents ask what they can do, I say they can do the same things that we are hoping schools will do. You can start a play club. You can say every Friday afternoon, my backyard is for anybody who wants to come over. You know, I'll be in the kitchen if you need me. And also the Let Grow Project, start sending your kids to do more. But the reason we sort of emphasize or put our money and time towards the school programs is because when you can get an entire school or an entire district to do either of these, you've changed so many lives at once. And as we were talking about before, it's much easier for a parent to let go if somebody else is saying it and if it's sort of sanctioned by the school, in fact, forced by the school and everybody else is doing it too. But I would never say, don't try this on your own. You know, find a friend who's willing to do this, you know, sit at a cafe and send your kids next door or to the bookstore. Or certainly you can do everything that we're suggesting through the schools you can do on your own or with a group in your neighborhood, or you can get your church or your synagogue or your library or the YMCA to consider these, but also bring our ideas to your kid's teacher or principal because they're free and they're easy and they are transformative. You know, a lot of teachers will say, I'd love to offer these opportunities, but I'm worried I'll get sued. I thought you were going to say, but they're going to take so much time. Either way, the answer is it's going to be okay, right? You're not going to get sued. You know, the kids are deciding with their parents what they're going to do. You're not saying every child has to go home and walk five miles, although... I did hear about one school where the principal recommended that, and that does sound like a fantastic idea, <laughs> but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> so Lenore, I guess I, you know we're coming to the end here. Is there any like final words you'd like to leave with the listeners? So the final word is that if you do remember being stupid as a kid and you're grateful that you had that opportunity give it to your kids. You know, we're trying to give them the best of everything. And sometimes the best of everything is staying inside while they're outside. Lenore, as always, it was a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Now, is the world more dangerous now than it was 50 years ago? Not according to crime statistics. Our violent crime and property crime rates in America are about the same as they were when I was a boy being sent outside as a four-year-old, although there was a little spike during the 80s and 90s. But we definitely perceive that the crime rate is higher. As Lenore points out, we are definitely more fearful now. But whatever the case, childhood independence is becoming increasingly rare. And unless we take proactive measures, as Lenore talks about, it's only going to become rarer. Now, I have no illusion that we're about to dramatically change our world 
or our fears anytime soon. And that means, I think, that it's on us, early childhood educators and parents of young children, to make our schools and our homes places in which children can, you know, as Lenore and I discussed, try a few stupid things. As I mentioned to Lenore, it was her work that inspired me and gave me the courage to start putting woodworking tools into the hands of young children. Now, as you think about the important children in your life, what are some of the things you can do, the little steps you can take? The easiest thing to do, I think, is to resist the urge to intervene or caution children over every little thing. As my friend and play worker, Maynell Ames jokes, I have a three-step approach to deciding what to do when a child is playing. The first step is to take a step back. <laughs> the second step is to take another step back. And the third step is to take one more. Now, obviously, we step in when life and limb are at stake or when you know real bullying is happening. But much of the time, it's our catastrophic imaginations that cause us to act when it's entirely unnecessary. A childhood is incomplete without a few scrapes and bruises, you know, maybe even a broken bone or two. When I first had the courage to bring real hammers and nails onto the playground, I did it with the utmost caution. We started with an old tree stump. I set up a ring of caution cones around it, then invited children in one at a time with eye protection to take a few swings at the nail that I had started for them. It sounds kind of pathetic now, but that's all I felt comfortable with at first. But slowly, as I began to see with my own eyes the incredible competence of young children, I began to see the care and caution that they took of their own accord. As I realized that my worst fears were very unlikely to be realized, as we gained experience, well, we added more hammers, along with other tools, until we had created a full-on woodworking experience for two to five-year-olds. Yes, there were some sore thumbs, but hitting your thumb with a hammer is an inescapable part of the process of learning to use a hammer. I'm 62 right now. If I picked up a hammer for the first time today, I assure you, I would have to learn the lesson of hitting my thumb. My point is that you don't have to put your kid alone on a New York City subway in order to give them the experience of childhood independence that everyone needs. We can all start small. Step back. Let them use a stapler, for example. Let them make their own snacks. Let them fail a few times in order to learn the lessons, the vital lessons of perseverance. We'll never go back to the 1970s, and I don't think we should want to. But with the help of people like Lenore and organizations like Let Grow, it's not too late for childhood independence. We can do it in our schools and our homes. This is it for this episode of Teacher Tom's Podcast. I can't tell you how grateful I am for your support. A great thank you to Lenore Skenazy for this amazing conversation. You'll find out more about Lenore at letgrow.org. That's L-E-T-G-R-O-W dot O-R-G. And in the show note, you'll find more about her and the link to the website. I'm Tom Hobson, and you've listened to Teacher Tom's podcast, Taking Play Seriously. You can find out more about me at teachertomsworld.com. That's T-E-A-C-H-E-R. T-O-M-S-W-O-R-L-D dot com. Teacher Tom's podcast is part of the Merisi FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Course Lab and Just Between Coaches. Stay tuned for more fun episodes by following us on Merisi's FM YouTube channel or your preferred podcast player. If you found today's insights valuable, take a moment and leave us a starred review. It will help us reach more people like you. Thanks for playing with me and catch you in the next episode.